Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the session on Unleashing the Power of Cluster API, Extensibility and Customization. Uh, my name is Nabir, and I'm here with my colleague Zane. Both of us work for a company called uh, City Storage Systems. We're headquartered in Los Angeles, California. Um, we're a company that focuses on improving the experience of food preparation, delivery, um, and like restaurant technologies. Uh, we have a whole suite of businesses starting from ghost kitchens to restaurant POS systems, all the way to uh, food preparation robots, actually. Uh, so a lot of these, a uh, lot of interesting challenges, a lot of interesting problems that we solve. Um, both Zane and I are part of the core infrastructure division. Uh, and what makes us unique is that we, we use Kubernetes, but we run our entire software stack on Kubernetes. So uh, we heavily rely on man, uh, self-managed software solutions instead of like managed offerings. Uh, so we run like all of these stuff like OLTP databases, our data warehouse systems, observability solutions. Um, and also all of our microservices, et cetera, on Kubernetes. Um, we primarily run large multi-tenant clusters. Um, some of these clusters could have as many as like 1,500 nodes. Um, and some of these clusters also have workloads uh, where we could have up to 10,000 pods. Um, right now, we're operating a little over 100 clusters in total. That number changes based on uh, various things like what kind of issues we're experiencing, uh, some business needs, yada, yada. We do have a multi-region active topology, so we're running in three different regions, uh, active with like an active mesh between all of them. Um, and for Kubernetes, we uh, only use managed Kubernetes. Uh, so currently, our, most of our clusters are running on AKS. We have some smaller footprint on a few other cloud providers like GKE, et cetera, as well. Um, and uh, like one of our key principles of operating infrastructure is no human in the loop operations. So throughout this talk, you'll hear us hear a lot about like how we evolve our operations. We're constantly op optimizing it to eliminate any kind of like manual operations or things that require human intervention. And it kind of allows us to operate uh, our entire infrastructure at scale uh, efficiently without any kind of like operational overhead. Cluster API, so how many of you, raise your hands if you've used Cluster API or heard about it? Oh, a lot of people. So uh, given our scale, um, we actually really like Cluster API. We, we use Cluster API to operate uh, and manage all of our Kubernetes clusters. Um, and for those of you who are not aware of it, uh, Cluster API is like a universal API for managing Kubernetes clusters across all cloud providers, bare metal, and so on. Uh, we like it for various different reasons, like it's um, declarative, um, the API uses uh, custom resources and uh, uses Kubernetes operator patterns, so we like it because we can represent the infrastructure um, as like uh, Kubernetes objects. Um, we like that it allows us to uniformly, allows us to have uniform operations across all of our cloud providers and all of their clusters. Uh, we definitely like the extensibility part of it, uh, as with any operators and custom resources, you can always implement additional custom resources and operators on top of them to encapsulate any kind of uh, business-specific needs that you might have. Uh, and like all of these things summed up allows us to scale um, to hundreds of clusters we operate and allows us to keep the, the operational overhead pretty minimum. So uh, we started looking into cluster API about three years ago. Um, at that time, we were migrating from uh, one cloud provider to a new one. We were using GKE initially, and then we were migrating to AKS. Uh, at the same time, we were also experiencing like explosive business growth, uh, where we went from like 10 plus clusters to 100 plus clusters very quickly. Um, at, the, at that time, the cluster API provider for AKS wasn't ready for general use, and we actually collaborated quite a bit with the open source community, contributed a lot of features uh, that allowed us to get it to a state where we could use it for our production use case. Um, and since then, like, once it was ready, like, we, we were able to use like, Cluster API and the provider for AKS. Uh, it's called CAPZ. Um, out of the box, it allows us to spin up clusters in as little as like, a couple of hours. Uh, so we're pretty happy with our experience. Cluster API does a job for us. Uh, we've been using it happily for last three years. So we just said Cluster API is perfect, 
right? Like, but that was not the case for us actually. Like, so let's talk about like few issues uh, we encounter in the online production, of course. And like this is the, I will only discuss one issue today because it's important to discuss the story of our journey of adopting Cluster API. I call it the ghost in the machine. So what was happening with us like after running Cluster API in production, nodes started disappearing. And I'm not talking about a graceful cordon and drain kind of operation. I'm talking about direct deletes. I think anyone who is running Kubernetes in production know like when the node is deleted, this is not really like anything that we want to sympathize or we want to be in that. And those abrupt deletions would cause like significant concern in our productions. And just to finish the impact of that bug, like one day, 60% of our nodes in productions were deleted at the same time. So let's let's take a look. We will explore the journey of like the beauty of distributed systems and how we discover issues. So the issue was basically root cause to the Kubernetes uh, node provider ID. So all Kubernetes uh, nodes, by default, they have in their spec a provider ID field. The provider ID field is used to uniquely identify the node globally. So basically, I'm using example of Azure VM instance. So it will have its subscription, resource group, virtual machine skill set, and uh, the instance ID also. But for some reasons, Cluster API was not uniquely identifying those things. So something was happening, going wrong. So let's take a look in the code snippets that we discovered. So what we found, like how CAPC was providing the ID of the cluster was taking the last slash of the string and just taking it as an ID. So that means like in this string, zero is the ID across all machine pools. So all we need to do is like just have another virtual machine skill set with the ID zero, and that will be misidentified with the same node. That was like one of the key factor in our issues. That means like uh, when the nodes are misidentified, they can be deleted abruptly. But to add to the injury, this race conditions was only triggered when we were scaling down. So when we were migrating to our others, all we were doing was scaling up scaling up till we reach our maximum capacity and we were stable. And the day then automatic scale down happened, like 60% of our nodes were gone. So just to summarize, the problem was the, the CAPC using the instance ID, the, and it was, which was not unique across uh, m machine pools. And that was leading to like a significant cluster instability and uh, causing significant pain for us in the production. To solve these issues, uh, I will say like we need to give kudos to the maintainers of the CAPC. Like uh, all of that I explained was discovered in a 30-minute Zoom call. A PR was landed and hotfix was released. So we came out of that like very quickly. This was not an issue that was open for weeks or months to say. This was just solved in minutes. So that was that was great. Now, like now, we can say that like, uh, this was the only issue we will say we encounter with cluster API and productions. Other than that, in our last three years, we have not encountered any big issue that would cause uh, outages in production. But now, with all these bugs fixed and uh, we are running smoothly again, uh, we were not finished because we were just still doing a lot of manual operations with the cluster API present there, and. Our job was not done till we quit babysitting like these manual operations. Now I will give a few examples of the manual operation that we were doing and what was causing that, and also how that cluster API is defined uh, generically for most of the customers. We need to adopt it to specific business needs. So the first problem, like to understand that, let's take a look how the AKS does an upgrade of a node pool. When AKS is doing a node pool upgrade, it will add a buffer node. That buffer node is empty. It will start draining the node. All the workloads will get evicted uh, till the node is empty, and that new node is then re-imaged. The old node is re-imaged, and now after re-imaged and being upgraded, it becomes a new node, new buffer node. And this process continues till the whole node pool has been upgraded. But the issue comes when we have certain workloads that are running in a node that won't allow draining. So the whole process will fail. It will, will get stuck. 
in the Azure portal or other places, we'll see the cluster in a failed state. It will tell us about the errors that it's encountering, why in that node some workload is having some issues. And this is not about like uh, misbehaving workloads totally because one of good example is like CNPG Postgres operator, which set the post disruption budget to m max available to zero, which means like we cannot drain that. The operator itself detects a node is being cordoned where the pods of the Postgres are running. It will start a failover of the replicas, active replicas, and then later change the pod disruption budget and expect that the node draining continues automatically. But that was not the case for us. So we needed a, we can find a workaround for that. So we need a, like a human in the loop who will just continue with that, f solve all this problem with the nodes that are being stuck one by one, looking at it, what is causing it, and then continue. The second problem, this is like a, another specific problem that we encountered because of our setup. So how I was explaining the node pool upgrades, what's happening is like uh, it's designed to think that uh, we are using the least allocated scheduler strategy, which means like the new node is empty. The buffer node is empty. So whenever we are evicting workloads, they will all end up in the empty node because that is the least used. This is the default Kubernetes strategy. So if I have 10 nodes, I'm scheduling 10 pods, all 10 pods will end up in node, all distributed in 10 nodes. But we run pretty tight bin-packed cluster, so we want all our nodes to be tightly bin-packed. To do that, we use a custom uh, scheduler strategy that is of most allocated, which means like it will try to find the nodes which still have some space to try to fill in all the capacity. So when the AKS upgrade is starting, we will find those nodes, start filling in, and almost always, nothing was getting scheduled at the buffer node. We were just bin packing better our clusters, and while we were doing that, we were just setting our workloads ready to be drained again. So if we are running a workload and it's going through a node pool upgrade process, it means it will be disrupted multiple times when we are doing this node pool upgrades. Now, this is a problem which is not very critical, but like it does makes the experience like not really great for the upgrades. Of course, we can add a human in the loop. That human can go and cordon all the rest of the nodes. So just when we are doing these upgrades, always the new nodes or buffer nodes that will get the pods. And once those pods are like scheduled on the buffer node, we can uncordon the ones. This is still a lot of manual operations, but just to saw, say, say that like we can do like something smoothly. Let's jump into the next problem. Uh, this is the immutable fields. Like, so for the context, like uh, all these cloud provider when they are offering this managed Kubernetes, like under the hood, they are like uh, offering a, a underlying implementation. For example, in the case of Azure, it's a node pool is a virtual machine skill set. So what we can do with a node pool in cluster API is basically limited by the limitations of virtual machine skill set. In a virtual machine skill set, we cannot change instance type. I cannot change from a regular to spot. We have to create a new virtual machine skill set. The same applies for if I want to move to a bigger virtual machine skill set, just because the requirements changed. Or some other like uh, uh, configuration like max pod that which are directly related to the network configuration of the virtual machine scale set. So how many NICs we are attaching to that VM depends on the max pods configuration that we are doing on the cluster API for that. This again caused like certain kind of like uh, uh, impediments for us to continue operating at scale because every time we are doing some kind of changes in the node pool we will have to do uh, encounter like these kind of like uh, immutable fields issues. Again, we can introduce another human in the loop. That human, what can do is like create a new node pool and gracefully delete the old node pool. So basically, we can continue with this process. New node pool is with the new settings. It's a new virtual machine scale set, and uh, it will just work out of the box. So these problems that I just uh, commented uh, are all about like different problems, and they still require a human in the loop to continue with the operations.
Okay, so I think we all know that uh, any kind of manual operation, or if you have a human in the loop process, it doesn't scale, right? So how do we automate it? Um, well, the good thing is that we are using Cluster API, and Cluster API is extensible. So I think the first idea we considered was if we use Cluster API, uh, build our own custom provider that encapsulates all of the, all of the cloud provider logic and our business-specific needs, uh, that could solve our problem. But later we figured out that uh, implementing the uh, cloud provider logic is unnecessary. So we decided to start with the foundation of Cluster API along with the Cluster API provider for Azure, CAPZ, um, and then only implement uh, custom extensions on top of it. All of these custom extensions are just like custom resources and controllers that encapsulate our business-specific needs and they extend the existing custom resources that come out of the box from uh, Cluster API and CAPC. Uh, so what does that look like? So these are some of the uh, custom resources that we use today. So at the bottom, we have the Cluster API ones. Uh, there's a Cluster CR and a Machine Pool CR. The Cluster a CR like, creates a cluster, or represents a cluster, and the Machine Pool CR uh, is for any node pools that you want to have. Uh, then we layer it with the Cluster API provider operator, uh, the controllers, and that introduces uh, Azure Manage Cluster, Azure Manage Control Plane CR. Uh, this along with the Cluster CR represents the control plane of each Kubernetes cluster, I guess. And then the, for node pools, we have Azure Manage Machine Pool CR, so that represents each node pool. Um, and then like what Zane pointed out earlier, um, the machine pools, every time we have to make any change to any of the immutable fields or we're doing like an upgrade or like a, uh, some kind of like rotation, uh, to encapsulate the whole process of like recreating, we introduce a node, node pool CR. The node, node pool CR is our, one of our custom extensions um, and that sits on top of the machine pool, uh, Azure Managed Machine Pool and the machine pool CRs. So with this new controller and the new custom resource, what does, what does our operation look like? So, uh, for example, we're taking like a life cycle, uh, node pool change life cycle. So be it changing the version, upgrading a version, or just simply changing instance family. So we start with a node pool CR, uh, the box on the left. Uh, so under the hood, that represents a machine pool. And a machine pool can have multiple nodes running workloads. If we change a field, if we need to change a field in the node pool, what we do is like we modify the node pool CR uh, and then the corresponding uh, controller then picks up this change. What it does is like, it creates a new machine pool, B, with the new settings, and new configurations, or new versions. Uh, it then taints all the nodes in the original machine pool, A, uh, and then drains all the workloads from this machine pool, A. Once that happens, it's drained onto the machine pool, B. Uh, it deletes the old machine pool, A. Uh, so I think the beauty of this process is that from the platform engineer's point of view, from our point of view, from the operations point of view, we're only interacting with the node pool CR. So we're making any changes in the node pool CR. And under the hood, the controller takes care of all the changes, be it creating a new node pool, be it replacing a node pool, or even like in-place modifications. And also from the workload's point of view, the developers that we serve their point of view, uh, this is a very opaque, uh, opaque like operation. So if you're running with some kind of taint or some kind of toleration, um, on, on a certain node pool, and we need to swap out uh, from like spot nodes to regular nodes, for example. Uh, we don't have to like go coordinate with the workload owners, or we don't have to like uh, disrupt all the workloads at once, uh, yada, yada. So it's like a, essentially this whole process is encapsulated in a very declarative API, the node pool CR, and the whole process is like programmatically handled. So uh, here are a few other like extensions we implemented. Uh, so a node pool was the one I explained. Uh, we also had additional configurations that we want to tweak on the control plane of AKS clusters. Uh, for example, we use a very custom um, cluster autoscaler profile uh, that also gets uh, configured in a, uh, in a separate, uh, separate custom resource. And there's a controller for it that takes care of like applying it to the control plane. Um, and again, this, this is not exhaustive. We keep adding new configurations. We keep adding new, control, uh, new controllers and custom resources all the, times, all the time as our business requirements change. Um, <clears throat> so
So as Nabir was explaining, we have solved all the problems that I was explaining earlier. Uh, this led to somehow leading to the establishment of a foundational principle that we apply now on platform engineering, and we call it objects democracy. What does it mean? It means like all Kubernetes life cycle related operational blocks need to be present as Kubernetes objects inside the uh, Kubernetes itself. What does it gives us? Like it's giving us like the freedom to solve all the problems on our own pace to build a platform that is sustainable. It gives uh, also like from the broader point of view a unified management, which means like we have a centralized control plane running in a management cluster, and which allow us to enable a centralized management of resources, configurations, and and policies across all clusters. The other thing that it gives us like the seamless abstractions. Like we just explained, we have a node pool that we just created, which encapsulates machine pools, multiple machine pools at the same times, but that can get extended to any other abstraction they want, which will hide the complexity away from our platform engineers who do not need to know the underlying complexities that comes with the uh, other resources. In this case, uh, when we are upgrading node pool, they do not need to understand like what are the limitations of a virtual machine skill set? What it also gives us like infinite in extensibility, which means like we can continue extending for the rapid adoption of the ch ever evolving changes in the business needs. If we need to move from a regular to spot nodes, we can figure out how to do that. And add plugins and other operators and CRs to continue extending whatever it needs to keep the human out of the loop which take us to like our ultimate goal, which is automation revolution. It means like we really do not want any human in the loop. We want to automate everything and have autonomous workflows in place, which will also drive the efficiency and reliability of our clusters. And above all, it what reduced was the errors, human introduced errors. The, as the error minimized by routine tasks, automated tasks of upgrades and other routine things that we were doing. So by embracing, the, embracing these like principles of the object democracy, we significantly reduced like the reliability issues we were facing and also improved like our infrastructure uh, robustness and efficiency. Okay, so I think in summary, so what does this all mean? Uh, so over the last few years, we've achieved our goal of it, uh, eliminating human loop processes and kind of achieving this like ultimate automation in our infrastructure management. So this whole principle of object democracy is so beautiful that we actually applied it to all of our infrastructure control plane. Um, so like I said earlier, we actually heavily use CNCF projects, a lot of open source stuff to, uh, that we manage ourselves. Um, so we applied this principle to all of them. We represent all of our infrastructure components, all of our abstractions, and all of the associated operations uh, using custom resources and controller. So right now on our, on our platform, we have about 130 custom resources uh, in the control plane. Um, and like, they work pretty seamlessly. We, can, we make modifications pretty frequently as well. And ultimately, like, the, the, the leverage we gain from applying this principle across our infrastructure stack is that we have complete control of end-to-end -end life cycle. And this gives us like a lot of power to platform engineers and then uh, in the end, like it gives us like operational efficiency that we need to scale. Um, so a couple of learnings from our journey adopting cluster API. Um, so one of the few messages that I want to leave you guys with, uh, the first one is we always prioritize business specific needs. So I think us as users of Kubernetes, us as platform engineers, it's very easy to say that uh, this is how Kubernetes is or this is how it should be used because Kubernetes is so easy to use out of the box. But I think we should always remember that like our ultimate goal is to serve the business that we have and also to serve the developers that rely upon us. So we should always be prioritizing what the business need, what are the unique constraints that our developers have. Uh, first adopter risk, it's very obvious. We were one of the early adopters of Cluster API, as Zane mentioned, one of the ghosts in our system bugs. 
Um, so anytime you uh, adopt something new, uh, I think it's a good mindset to have to embrace these kinds of hiccups and be ready for those, right? I mean, these happen. We, we, we've been in the industry for long enough where we know that uh, these kinds of mishaps will happen and just be ready to handle those. Um, and one of the unexpected results we got by focusing so heavily on automation is automation actually increased our reliability. So before we actually moved to cluster API, we had a semi-manual process uh, of like provisioning and lifecycle management for clusters. Uh, we saw that like every time we would do like an upgrade, Kubernetes version upgrade, we would have at least one internal incident. Uh, since we switched to cluster API, we've done about four or five version upgrades and we've had absolutely zero uh, incidents uh, rising from it. Uh, and the last idea I want to leave you guys with is Kubernetes is not an end product. Uh, Kubernetes is actually a framework for building platforms. And us as platform engineers, it's our job to actually tailor these platforms to what the business needs. And Kubernetes is so extensible, so versatile, and all these, all these software like Cluster API uh, is so extensible, we should definitely be leveraging these principles um, to do so. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to leave a few links here. So uh, have a QR code to both Zane and my LinkedIn profiles. If you guys want to reach out to us, have any questions, have a discussion, we're always happy to chat. Um, you can download the slides if you want. And we wrote a blog post about this topic where we go into a little more detail. If you want to check it out, I'll leave it up here for, for you guys. Um, and I think we have a few more minutes. So if you guys have any questions, we'll take a few. Convenient, and uh, one can say that uh, during the upgrade, we will face the uh, pod, uh, the node will be upgraded. We may have a uh, new uh, AMI uh, like for, for uh, uh, AWS. We have a new, a new AMI for the uh, nodes, and it will be uh, upgraded for the machine pool, and may cause pod to be uh, you know, deleted and uh, restarted. So, so how you handle these situations during the upgrade? I can, I can explain too. Yeah. So I think um, there are a few details. We I think the question was like uh, during during a version upgrade for Kubernetes using Cluster API, there could be unexpected disruptions to Pod. How do you handle those? Uh, so we left out some details from the slides, but um, so often. There are two two principles. One is like practicing good hygiene with application configurations. So like not allowing pod disruption budget max unavailable zero, for example, or uh, things like safe to evict false, yada yada. So and that's sometimes hard to achieve as well. So we actually have controllers in place where um, we allow workloads to plug into like a graceful shutdown uh, pre webhook, and what it does is like it calls some kind of application state allows the application to shut down before there is like a, a eviction call. Uh, so we, we allow our applications to like configure this like however they want to. It's like very, uh, it's, it's extremely configurable, like it's like extremely flexible and it plugs into like the eviction object that Kubernetes creates. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, can you please tell some uh, how you deploy these manifests or custom resources to uh, production? You use Helm charts, maybe. Uh, how you store it? Maybe you use Terraform above it to store state, and so on. Thank you. Yeah. So I think um, for for applications, we use Helm charts extensively. Um, so we have a microservices architecture, uh, over a thousand microservices at this point. Uh, so they're all Helm charts. Uh, sort in Git. We, our application delivery pipeline uses GitOps. 
so it's delivered from, uh, from repositories. So all changes are initiated uh, in Git and then are deployed using our CI systems. Uh, and then we apply the same principles for all the custom resources that we have to manage infrastructure as well. So applications, infrastructure, everything goes through the same CI pipelines. Uh, everything is configured in help. Okay. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, reach out to us. We're always happy to chat, and thanks for listening to us.